Welcome to Module 2.3, Investigating Workplace Community Transmission in an Outbreak. Here, we investigate genomic relationships between workplace and community transmission during a workplace outbreak. This presentation is a part of the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit from CDC's Office of Advanced Molecular Detection. My name is Nicholas Leonards, and I'm a physician and epidemiologist at the Minnesota Department of Health. This is the third set of three case studies that we will review to provide insight into how whole genome sequencing can be used as an investigative tool in outbreak settings. Be sure to check out the toolkit's other modules, which include a combination of case studies and training materials to help get you started supplementing epidemiology with genome sequence data. In this module, we will be focusing on COVID-19 in meat processing plants. As you may know, meat and poultry processing is essential to the U.S. food infrastructure. This industry employs approximately 500,000 workers in the country. Many states, including Minnesota, have reported COVID-19 cases among workers in meat processing plants. Preventing COVID-19 among these workers is challenging from two aspects. First, at the workplace, always maintaining physical distance between workers can be difficult, and implementation of screening and isolation of ill workers is resource intensive. Second, in the community, there are often language barriers between workers and public health workers. Third, workers often reside in crowded living conditions. When investigating clusters or outbreaks in meat processing plants, it is helpful to understand how community transmission and workplace transmission can be intertwined. This can help public health workers focus their prevention efforts appropriately. In spring of 2020, Minnesota Department of Health investigated an outbreak of COVID-19 in a meat processing plant known as Processing Plant A. Specifically, from March 15th to July 1st, 446 confirmed cases of COVID-19 were identified that reported working at Processing Plant A. In the beginning, only a few cases were identified with nine cases identified between March and April. In March, four cases were reported among administrative and office workers. And in April, five cases were reported. Later in May to June, 437 cases were identified with 211 cases reported in May and 226 reported in June. A few characteristics of processing plan A. The physical environment consisted of multiple buildings. To reduce the likelihood of spreading possible meat contaminants during processing, travel between buildings was strictly controlled. This was especially true for movement between buildings involved in raw processing and those handling the finished product. Another characteristic was that cases were identified among administrative workers as well as those employed on the food line. And lastly, many of the workers reported sharing transportation and residence with other workers. To better understand how transmission of COVID-19 was happening among these workers, we used genomic sequencing to help better understand the role of both community and workplace transmission patterns. If transmission was identified within the processing plant, we would have evidence to support the need for enhanced education and communication for prevention measures in the workplace. And if within the community, we would focus on education and communication for community-based interventions. As such, two hypotheses were formulated. Hypothesis one held that transmission among cases was occurring primarily within the processing plant. For this hypothesis, an expected sequencing result would be that SARS-CoV-2 genomes from all cases in the plant are closely related, supporting a single introduction. In contrast, hypothesis two held that some cases were exposed to SARS-CoV-2 in the community outside processing plant A. For this hypothesis, an expected sequencing result would be that the outbreak consisted of multiple different SARS-CoV-2 genomes supporting multiple introductions. Now, we were able to successfully sequence genomes from a small minority of total cases. Part of the reason is that during the outbreak, the vast majority of specimens were collected and tested by outside laboratories, and after completion of the testing, the samples were discarded. These included cases from both processing plant A and from the community, specifically the county. From processing plant A, we sequenced 16 of the 446 cases representing 4% of the total cases. 
And from the county community, we sequenced eight resident cases, six of whom had no known contact with plant workers. As you can see here, we have a phylogenetic tree of various SARS-CoV-2 sequences from processing plant A and in the surrounding community. Stars represent cases from the plant and triangles represent cases in the community. The first thing you notice is that there are differences among these cases. You can see there are multiple clades with cases that are closely related, but that these clades are distantly related. These findings do not support the hypothesis that most cases are caused by a single strain being introduced into the plant and then followed by on-site transmission. Rather, the findings support multiple introductions among these analyzed cases. Now, when looking at this tree a little closer, we can see that of the eight cases from the community that were sequenced, five cases clustered with genome from employees at processing plant A. Six of the eight cases from the community had no known contact with plant members. These findings further support that cases from processing plant A had acquired SARS-CoV-2 from the community rather than on-site transmission in the plant. There are, there are a few key takeaways from this work. First, when epidemiologic findings point to potential transmission at a site where people gather, whether in occupational work setting, healthcare facilities, social setting, et cetera, genomic data can help provide clarity on the transmission dynamics. Second, from these findings, public health officials had the data to support the recommendation that interventions at the community level were critical to combat this outbreak. These included providing more independent housing and transportation, providing masks, and generating culturally appropriate messaging and peer support to disseminate in the community. And third, with evidence suggesting that there were repeated introductions at the plant from the community, these findings reinforced the need for continued prevention strategies at the plant, including symptom screening, enforcement of distancing and masking, and other prevention strategies. Now, there are two main limitations to this work. One is representativeness of the collection of sequenced cases. Only 4% of the total cases from processing plant A were able to be sequenced. This affects the conclusions that can be drawn from this sample of sequenced cases to the entire outbreak that, that occurred at processing plant A. This is a reminder of how essential it is to encourage your jurisdiction to sequence as many cases, priority cases, or a random sample of cases when investigating a cluster or outbreak. This concludes module 2.3. The remainder of the toolkit focuses on useful tools and skills to apply genomic data, and in particular, to integrate that data with the epidemiologic or clinical data. Please visit the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit page, where you can find further reading on this topic. On the toolkit page, you can also subscribe to our mailing list and receive announcements as new modules and materials are released. We want to acknowledge the Minnesota Public Health Laboratory, especially Dr. Sean Wang and the sequencing and bioinformatics lab staff who performed the sequencing and bioinformatics analyses. We also want to thank Dr. Ruth Linfield, Minnesota's state epidemiologist. Thank you.